Good morning. Not many people today. I guess nobody wanted to come out on this beautiful day. I don't know, are they afraid of Halloween? Exactly. Well, welcome to Hallow's Eve. Let's all worship God together. Come along with me as a sojourner in faith. Bring along a sense of expectancy, a vision of high hopes, a glimpse of the future, possibly a vivid imagination. Let us travel light in the spirit of faith and expectation toward the God of our hopes and dreams. Let's all sing the hymn of adoration, All the Way My Savior Leads Me. Let us pray. Holy God, we praise in the fabric of our days so our lives become blessings to others. Weave peace into our words and deeds so hatred and anger are disarmed. Weave love into our work so accomplishments are imbued with humility. Weave kindness into our actions so that the world becomes a joyous place to live. 
Weave hope into every encounter so we may testify to God's continuing resurrection. Weave songs into our worship so morning might echo in praise to God. Holy Spirit, thank you for your presence here. Thank you for guiding us as, as we journey along life's path. Thank you for knowing the words we wish to pray, but can't. Thank you for the gentle whispers. Thank you for giving us great comfort. Without you, we would be lost. And so we take a moment to express our gratitude. And we thank you, Father, for giving us the Spirit. So that way, me, that way we may know the Son, as he taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Psalm today is Psalm 146, verses 1 through 5. I will praise the Lord all my life. I will sing praise to my God as long as I live. When their spirit departs, they return to the ground. On that very day, their plans came to nothing. And we may, may we all greet each other. Good morning, everybody. Good morning out there in TV land. Hopefully you're all joining us with a happy smile and good faith. You may be seated, please. Uh, announcements. Uh, sharing a source of healing. Warren's Churches Association, they're doing the uh, Experience, uh, meeting with adults for experiencing mental health needs, uh, small groups. Uh, they're m actually meeting on Monday, October 11th. Wait a minute, that was a long, oh, and then six weeks starting on, mon on Monday uh, over at the Andreozzi Hall and the Warren Senior Center in, uh, on, off Medicum Avenue. Uh, our October mission is World Mission Offering. Uh, the other mission, and I know it keeps going on well, and I know that Priscilla had brought quite a bit of food already, and they totally enjoy the fact that we've been able to help them out in some way. But please, let's just keep giving, especially, uh, I know that there was a brownie mix in there, there was cereal, soup, and mac and cheese. That's what it was. Every kid's favorite. Gotta have the mac and cheese. Oh, they give brownies out for the baskets that they do for Thanksgiving and Christmas? Oh, nice. Well, good for them. And as normally offering basket out on the hallway, um, we're still keeping it safe. One other thing is I know, because I had done the deposit on Monday for the craft fair, I deposited, and I think there's still a little bit left behind, but it was $1,188 that we were able to raise through two days of that craft fair. And after speaking with most of the participants, everybody else seemed to feel as if it was well worth doing it again next year. So let's hope with a little bit of the Lord's help we can get another good craft fair next year and on to the cookie walk. Right? 8,000? Louisiana. Great. And also, we also have to remember that we have the quilt raffle uh, that Priscilla had posted, and we have to keep trying to push that because it's such a beautiful piece of art. We are blessed to have somebody to do things like that for us. Very much so. 
And is there any prayer concerns for today? No. Mr. Joe, how's he doing? Getting a surgery Tuesday. So that way he can be prepared for his surgery on Tuesday. Well, hopefully the Lord blesses him with a good outcome. Any other? Yes, Jeff. Wow, that's awesome. Well, so that was the Warren Preservation Group? Yeah. Well, thank, thank the Lord for them because that's a great donation from them. Oh, yeah, they live next door, correct. Yep. Yep. Well, that's good, and I'm glad that. The Historical Society is working towards trying to maybe better what we're trying to accomplish here. And let's hope that through some good channels and a lot of hard work that it gets accomplished. Our offering to God, let us be in a spirit of giving as we give our offerings to the Lord.
give our gifts with gratitude, loving God, in response to all that we have been given. And yet, we would ask you to stretch our giving. Help us to have the courage to change the rules and give even more in thanksgiving to Christ who has given his all. As we dedicate our offering to you, we dedicate our lives anew, picking up the cross and following Jesus. We love, we give our gifts in love and thanksgiving for all that we have been given. Let our gracious God not be the end point, but rather the beginning. Let our gifts of love and gratitude travel where we do not, making pathways of hope where there is none. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. By him a worship, he leadeth me.
The scripture reading this morning is from the book of Mark, chapter 12, verses 28 through 34, the first commandment. One of the scribes came near and heard them disputing with one another. And seeing that he answered them well, he asked him, which commandment is the first of all? Jesus answered, the first one, the first is hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind, and with all your strength. The second is this, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. Then the scribe said to him, you are right, teacher. You have truly said that he is one, and besides him there is no other, and to love him with all the heart and with all the understanding and with all the strength, and to love one's neighbor as oneself. This is much more important than the whole burnt offerings and sacrifices. When Jesus saw that he answered wisely, he said to him, You are not far from the kingdom of God. After that, no one dared ask him any questions. May the Lord have his blessing to the reading of his word. What does the text say today? In this text, a scribe is speaking for himself and not as a representative of some group. The scribe is immediately impressed with Jesus' answer. Consequently, unlike the baiting, belligerent questions posed by others to text, test Jesus, the scribe's inquiry seems to arise from a sense of respect for Jesus. Which commandment is the first of all, he asks, verse 28. The first half of Jesus' reply is hardly astonishing. The second half of Jesus' answer to the scribe's question comes from Leviticus 19.18. When coupled with the mandates of the Sheham, the commandment well, well, wells personal piety to achieve ethical behavior. Jesus fully intends that these two commandments to be as one inseparable mandate. Note that he concludes, there is no commandment greater than these, suggesting that these commandments should be designated as numbers one and one not one and two. The commandments Jesus chose as most important are highly theological and ethical in nature. While the practices the scribes chose with which to contrast them are ritual. In fact, the scribe, in making this kind of comparison while standing in the temple, the center of all Jewish cultural, cultic ritual activity, is being quite indiscreet. Jesus' final word to the scribe also differentiate the exchange from other combative challenges Jesus has faced that day. Mark's text, which generally has a few good things to say about the religious authorities, specifically compliments this scribe. He answered wisely. Jesus' response is also unique. When he announces that this scribe is not far from the kingdom of God, verse 34, it is clear that his kingdom reference is not to the, oh boy, extracolatical age to come. Instead, it appears to refer more to the condition that exists here and now. The kingdom of God for which the scribe is almost ready seems more like the good news of the gospel itself, which once received will put on a path towards eternal kingdom. This exchange between Jesus and the scribe became something of an illustration of the great commandment. Jesus and the scribe have stepped away from us versus them categories and created an island of reconciliation in a sea of hostility. Their common devotion to God and neighbor silences the debate, and Mark reports, 
After that, no one dared to ask him any question. Verse 34. May we take a time to reflect with some silent meditation. Let us pray. Most loving God, we thank you for this time together, this sacred space of prayer. We thank you that you are always present to us to guide and to strengthen, especially when we are uncertain and lonely. We would pray for those who feel abandoned and isolated and therefore feel as though they have been left behind while everyone else continues on their way. We offer our prayer for those who are in transition and feel as though they walk on unsafe ground. We lift our prayers for those who are far away from home in unfamiliar lands. May all for whom we pray feel surrounded by your love through the power of the Holy Spirit. Keep us in mind, Jesus, who walked this earth as we do, 
who also felt loneliness and betrayal, but who triumphed over all adversity and lives forever, lives forever as our sure foundation, the very ground of our being. Help us to remember that no matter where we are, you are there. And please, Lord, at this time, please be with Joe tomorrow on Tuesday. Even though it's an exploratory surgery, it's a still a surgery, and he will hopefully come out with your grace with a better result. And Lord, also bless our projects along the way that they may become to the way that we want them and we get back to having a good solid roof for our great foundation. Father, we know that you hear us and more than that, you respond to our cries. We are a hurting people. We are sick, we are lost, we are sinful. Heal us, find us, free us. We hold secrets in our hearts that only you know. With loving grace, draw us to bring those to light. We are safe in you. We are forgiven by you. We are healed by your hand. Father, bring peace where there is anxiety, hope where there is despair, and mercy where there is failure. We cry out to you because we know you are near. It is with hope and assurance we pray to you. Amen. I have a petition today is Precious Lord, Take My Hand. The scripture text today comes from Ruth 1, 
verses 1 through 18. In the days when the judges ruled, there was a famine in the land, and a certain man in Bethlehem in Judah went to live in the country of Moab. He and his wife had two sons. The name of the man was Elimelech, and his wife, Naomi. And the names of the two sons were Malon and Chilion. They were Ephrathites from Bethlehem in Judah. They went to the country of Moab and remained there. But Emelech and his husband, the husband of Naomi died, and she was left with her two sons. Though these took Moab, Moabite wives. The name of one was Ophrah, and the other was Ruth. When they had lived there about 10 years, both Malon and Chilion also died. So the woman was left without her two sons and her husband. Then she started to return with her daughter-in-law from the country of Moab. For she had heard in the country of Moab that the Lord had considered his people and given them food. So she set out from the place where she had been living, she and her two daughter-in-law, and they went on their way to go back to the land of Judah. But Naomi said to her two daughter-in-law, go back, each of you, to your mother's house. May the Lord deal kindly with you, and you have dealt with the dead and with me. The Lord grant that you may find security, each of you, in the house of your husband. Then she kissed them, and they wept aloud. They said to her, No, we will return with you to your people. But Naomi said, Turn back, my daughters. Why will you go with me? Do I still have son in my wombs that may become your husbands? Turn back, my daughters. Go your way, for I am too old to have a husband. Even if I thought there were hope for me, even if I should have a husband tonight and bear sons, would you then wait until they are grown? Would you then refrain from marrying? No, my daughters. It has been far more bitter for me than for you, because the hand of the Lord has turned against me. Then they wept aloud again. Oprah kissed her mother-in-law, but Ruth clung to her. She said, see, your sister-in-law has gone back to her people and to her gods. Return after your sister-in-law. But Ruth said, do not press me to leave. You are, you are to turn back from following you. Where you go, I will go. Where you lodge, I will lodge. Your people shall be my people, and your God, my God. Where you die, I will die. There I will be buried. May the Lord do thus and so to me, and more as well, if even the death parts me from you. When Naomi saw that she was determined to go with her, she said no more to her. As we all know, tomorrow is All Saints Day, and today is the Day of Hallow's Eve, as they say, or in the modern day of Halloween. So I had found a pretty fitting sermon for today. I hope you can bear with me, and I hope you enjoy it. It's it has to do with something that really makes you realize and steps us back to what the true meaning of today is. Halloween is a time of year when the air gets crisper, the days get shorter, and for many young Americans, the excitement grows in anticipation of the darkest, spookiest holiday of the year. Hmm. Retailers also rejoice as they warm up their cash registers to receive an average of 80 bucks per household in decorations, costumes, candy, and greeting cards. 
Unless somebody makes their own, and then they don't make out so well, do they? Halloween will bring approximately $8 billion this year. It's a good bet retailers won't entertain high expectations of getting 80 bucks per household from the Christian market. Many Christians refuse to participate in Halloween. So are wary of its pagan or, uh, origins, other of its dark, ghoulish imagery. And boy, we see some of that. Still others are concerned for the safety of their children, but other Christians choose to partake of the festivities, whether participating in school activities, neighborhood trick-or-treating, Halloween alternative at their church. The question is, how should cr Christians respond to Halloween? Is it irresponsible for parents to let their children trick or treat? What about Christians who refuse any kind of celebration during the season? Are they overreacting? But here's the origin, the pagan origin of Halloween. The name Halloween comes from All Saints Day celebration of the early Christian church, a day set aside for the solemn remembrance of their martyrs. All Hallows' Eve, the evening before All Saints' Day, began the time of remembrance. All Hallows' Eve eventually contracted to Halloween, which became Halloween, because we want to modernize everything. As Christianity moved through Europe, it collided with indigenous pagan cultures and confronted established customs. Pagan holidays and festivals were so entrenched that new converts found them to be stumbling blocks to their faith. To deal with the problem, the organized church would commonly move the distinctively Christian holiday to a spot on the calendar that would directly challenge a pagan holiday. Their intent was to counter pagan influences and to provide a Christian alternative, but most often, the church has only succeeded in Christianizing an already pagan ritual. The ritual was still pagan, but mixed with Christian symbolism. That's what happened to All Saints' Eve. It was the original holiday alternative. The Celtic people of Europe and Britain were pagan druids whose major celebrations were mocked by their seasons. All at the end of the year in Northern Europe, people made preparations to ensure winter survival by harvesting crops and culling the herds, slaughtering animals that wouldn't make it. Life slowed down as winter brought darkness, shorter days and longer nights, fallow ground and death. The imagery of death symbolized by skeletons, skulls, and the color black remains prominent in today's Halloween celebrations. The pagan Sowen festival celebrated the final harvest, death, and onset of winter for three days, October 31st through November 2nd. The Celts believed the curtain dividing the living and the dead lifted during Sowen and allow the spirits of the dead to walk among the living. Mm. Ghosts haunting the earth. Some embrace the season by haunting, by, of haunting by engaging in occult practices such as divination and communication with the dead. They sought divine spirits, demons, and the spirits of their ancestors regarding weather forecasts for the coming year, crop expectations, and even romantic prospects. Bobbing for apples was, I don't see why, but bobbing for apples was one practice the pagans used to divine the spirit's world blessings on a couple's romance. Seems a little strange. For others, the focus on death, occultism, divination, and thought of spirits returning to haunt their living fueled ignorant superstitions and fears. They believed spirits were earthbound until they received the proper send-off with treats, possessions, wealth, food, drink. Spirits who were not suitably treated would trick those who neglected them. The fear of haunting only multiplied in that spirit 
had been offended during its natural lifetime. Trick bent spirits were believed to assume grotesque appearances. Some traditions believed or developed which believed wearing a costume to look like a spirit would fool the wandering spirits. Others believed the spirits could be warded off by carving grotesque faces in a gourd or root vegetable. The Scottish used turnips. What a waste of a good meal. And setting a candle inside of it, the jack-o'-lantern. In that dark, superstitious, pagan world, God mercifully shined the light on his gospel. Newly converted Christians armed themselves with truth and no longer feared a haunting from departed spirits returning to earth. In fact, they denounced their former pagan spiritism in accordance with Deuteronomy 18. There shall not be found among you anyone who uses divination, one who practices witchcraft, or one who interprets omens, or sorcerer, or one who spells a cast, cast a spell, on a med or a medium, or a spiritist, or one who calls up the dead. For whoever does these things is detestable to the Lord. Deuteronomy 18, verse 10 through 13. Nonetheless, Christian converts found family and cultural influence hard to withstand. They were tempted to rejoin the pagan festivals, especially Soam. Pope Gregory IV reacted to the pagan challenge by moving the celebration of All Saints Day in the 19th century. He set the date as November 1st, right in the middle of Soan. As the centuries passed, Soan and All Hallow Eves mixed together. On the other hand, pagan superstition gave way to Christianized superstitions and provided more fodder for fear. People began to understand that the pagan ancestral spirits were demons and diviners were practicing witchcraft and necro necromancy. On the other hand, the festival time provided greater opportunity for revelry. Trick or treat became a time when roving bands of young hooligans would go house to house gathering food and drink for their parties. But stingy householders ran the risk of a trick by being played on their property from drunken young people. Halloween didn't become an American holiday until the immigration of the working class from the British Isles in the late 19th century. While early immigrants may have believed the superstitious traditions, it was the mischievous aspects of the holiday that attracted, attracted American young people. Younger generations borrowed and adapted many customs without reference to their pagan origins. Hollywood has added to the fun a wide assortment of fictional characters, demons, monsters, vampires, werewolves, mummies, and psychopaths. They certainly, that certainly isn't improving the American mind, but it's sure making somebody a lot of money. Today's Halloween is almost exclusively an American secular holiday, but many who celebrate have no concept of its religious origins or pagan heritage. That's not to say Halloween has become more wholesome. Children dress up in entertaining costumes, wander the neighborhood in search of candy, and tell each other ghost stories, but adults often engage in shameless acts of drunkenness and debauchery. So how should Christians respond? First, Christians should not respond to Halloween like superstitious pagans. Pagans are superstitious. Christians are enlightened by the truth of God's word. Evil spirits are more active and sinister on Halloween than they are on any other day of the year. In fact, any day is a good day for Satan to prowl about seeking whom he may devour. 
And that came from 1 Peter uh, 5, uh, verse 8. But greater is he who is in you that who, that he who is in the world. Sorry about that. That came from, let me do that again. But greater is he who is in you that he who is in the world. 1 John 4.4. 4. God has forever disarmed principalities and powers through the cross of Christ and made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them through Christ. Colossians 2.15. Second, Christians should respond to Halloween with precautionary wisdom. Some people fear the activity of Satanists or pagan witches but the actual incidents of satanic associated crime are very low. The real threat on Halloween is from the social problems that attend sinful behavior, drunk driving, pranksters, vandalism, and unsupervised children. Like any other day of the year, Christians should exercise caution as wise stewards to their possessions and protectors of their families. Christian young people should stay away from secular uh, Halloween parties since they are breeding grounds for trouble. Christian parents can protect their children by keeping them well supervised and restricting their tree consumption to those goodies received from trusted sources. And third, Christians should respond to Halloween with gospel compassion. The unbelieving, Christ-rejecting world lives lives in perpetual fear of death. It isn't just the experience of death, but rather what the Bible calls a certain terrifying expectation of judgment and the fury of fire, which will consume God's adversaries. That comes from Hebrew 10, 27. Witches, ghosts, and evil spirits are not terrifying. God's wrath unleashed on the unforgiven sinner, now that is truly terrifying. Christians should use Halloween and all of that it brings to the imagination. Death imagery, superstition, expression of debauchery, revelry, as an opportunity to engage the unbelieving world with the gospel of Jesus Christ. God has given everyone conscious that responds to his truth, Romans 2, 14 through 16. And the conscious is the Christ's ally in the evangelistic enterprise. Christians should take time to inform the conscious of friends and family with biblical truth regarding God, the Bible, sin, Christ, future judgment, and the hope of eternal life in Jesus Christ, the repentant sinner. There are several ways Christians will engage in Halloween evangelism. Some will adapt the no participation policy. As Christian parents, they don't want their kids participating in spiritually compromising activities, listening to ghost stories, coloring witches, They don't want their kids to dress up in costumes for trick-or-treating or or even attending Halloween alternatives. Hmm. That response naturally raises eyebrows and provides a good opportunity to share the gospel to those who ask. It's also important that parents explain their stand to their children and prepare them to face the teasing or ridicule of their peers and the disapproval or scorn of their teachers. Other Christians will adapt the Halloween alternative called Harvest Festivals or Reformation Festivals. The kids dress up as farmers, biblical characters, or Reformation heroes. It's ironic when you consider Halloween's beginning as an alternative, but it can, re- it can be effective means by reaching out to the neighborhood families with gospel. Some churches leave the church building behind and take acts of mercy into the community. 
treating needy family with food baskets, gift cards, and a gospel message. These are all good alternatives. There are others that are not so good. Some churches are using hell house evangelism to shock young people and to scare them into becoming Christians. They walk people through rooms patterned after carnival-style haunted houses and put sin on display. Women undergoing abortions, people sacrificed in a satanic ritual, consequences of premarital sex, dangers of rave parties, demon possession, and other tragedies. Here is the problem with so-called hell house evangelism. To shock an unshockable culture, you have to get pretty graphic. Graphic exhibits of sin and its consequences are really unnecessary. Unbelieving minds are already full of such images. They see it all the time. What they need to see is a life truly transformed by the power of God. And what they need to hear is the truth of God in an accurate presentation of the gospel. Cheap, cheap gimmickry and unfitting for Christ's ambassadors. There's another option open to Christians, limited non-compromising participation in Halloween. There's nothing inherently evil about candy, costumes, or trick-or-treating in the neighborhood. In fact, all that can provide a unique gospel opportunity with neighbors. Even handing out candy to neighborhood children, provided you're not stingy, can improve the reputation among the kids. As long as the costumes are innocent and the behavior does not dishonor Christ, trick-or-treating can be used to further gospel interests. Ultimately, Christians participate in Halloween is a matter of conscience before God. Whatever level of Halloween participation you choose, you must honor God by keeping yourself separate from the world and by showing mercy to those who are perishing. Halloween provides the Christian with the opportunity to accomplish both of these things in the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's a message that is holy, set apart from the world. It is a message that is the very mercy of a forgiving God. What better time of the year is there to share such a message than Halloween? Amen. Please join us in the hymn of benediction, Blessed Assurance.
created in the image of God, redeemed by the cross of Christ, empowered by God's Spirit, we are sent. Sent to live a faithful, loving stewards of God's gracious gift and hope and joy. Amen. Happy Halloween. Thank you.